Hello guys and welcome back to our online platform. Of course, this is the number one uh, online platform that gives you the best tutorials. And uh, still under differential calculus. And uh, here today we are going to introduce functions. So introduction to functions. Uh, suppose I have two sets. The set A which consists of element X and the set B which consists of element Y. You realize uh, there could be a relationship that uh, maps the element X in A to uh, the element Y in B. Such a relationship that maps the element X uh, to uh, the element Y is called a function. So we can have definition and uh, say uh, definition and this is the definition of a real valued function. The definition of a real valued function. So what is a function? So suppose we have the set A and B. Still I'm, I'll be using set in order to simplify uh, the definition and uh, to uh, enhance your understanding. So suppose I have two sets A and B. So let A and B be sets. Sets of what? Sets of real numbers. That is why I said it is a, a real valued function. And this definition is a definition of a real valued function. So let A and B be sets of real uh, numbers. A real valued function, a real valued function f, a real valued function f, such that this f maps the elements of the set A to the elements of the set B. So A maps the element, the function f maps the element A uh, to the elements of the set B is a rule of correspondence. that assigns to each number x in A, we can as well write this x in A, exactly one number y in B we can as well write this y in b like that. So, a real valued function uh, is uh, a function or is a rule of correspondence that maps an element x in the set A to a corresponding uh, one element y in the set B to a corresponding one exactly element y in the set B. So if we have a rule uh, that maps elements of the set A to corresponding one element of the set B, then that qualifies to be a function. So this is the definition of a real valued function. And you realize uh, many real life situations can be modeled uh, by function. For instance, uh, the area of a circle. We all know that the area of a circle is given by pi r squared. The area of a circle is given by pi r squared. So this is a function of the radius r. Why? Because the area A depends on the radius r. Such that we say here, uh, r is the independent variable and a is the dependent variable. So this is a function. This is a function. Why? Because if you give me a radius r, it will give me only a single area. That is uh, the rule of a function. It must give a one a specific uh, uh, output. So you realize uh, for our case here that uh, every element of x 
is assigned to a corresponding one element y in b. Every element x in a is assigned to a corresponding element y in b. Uh, you realize the domain, the domain of this function. Uh, later we will be discussing about domain and range. We will get to understand them better. But basically domain uh, is uh, uh, those uh, inputs in which the function will give us an output. So the domain uh, of the function f, uh, which is denoted by uh, that, that is the domain of uh, the function f, is the set uh, a, is the set A. So in this case, because A is mapped to B, uh, every element in A is assigned to a corresponding element in B, to one corresponding element in B. So A is the domain. A is the set that has the inputs values. Uh, we can also write this uh, symbolically as uh, the domain of F is the set of elements of X such that x is a member of a and we said it is a real valued function so a is also a subset of real numbers is also a subset of real numbers and we can have our domain like that uh, also uh, we know that the range we will also talk about range uh, on a greater depth uh, of the function f which is also uh, denoted by a uh, range like that, is uh, the set uh, B, is the set B. Uh, the, uh, basically, the range is all possible outputs. It is the set of all possible outputs. So we are taking A, mapping it to B. So the possible output is the set B. That is why we are having the range uh, of the function as the set B. Uh, it consists of all images of the numbers in A. It, this B, the set B, consists of all images of the numbers or rather the members of A. And it can also be uh, represented symbolically as uh, the range of uh, F of X is actually a subset of B because um, maybe could be some members are not uh, actually uh, outputs and such that uh, this x is in real uh, numbers that is why we said a real valued function so basically that uh, is uh, how we define a function but uh, we will uh, try to explain functions in layman's term so that we get to understand uh, even better about function so let's now uh, talk about functions in great depth you realize basically in layman's term a function is an expression where each input has exactly one output so we can say uh, a function uh, a function is uh, some expression is some expression where each input and we can say this input is x like for our case uh, has exactly one output that is y so basically a function is an expression where each input x if we take a value of x we plug it in a, in a function then that must give us only one only one output very important only one output there is a function and we know there are several ways that we can represent functions like for instance we can represent functions in terms of uh, 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 tables we can represent functions in terms of graphs we can represent functions in terms of formulas so basically uh, if uh, we see a graph, we should be able to tell if that graph is representing a function. If we see a formula, we should be able to tell if that formula is representing a function and so on. So maybe we can have some examples and uh, see if we can identify uh, the table represent a formula or uh, uh, the graph represent a formula. Maybe we can have an example. 
So examples, actually uh, it's not one example, but we can have a number of them. So we realize we can represent functions in tables. Suppose I have books, uh, various types of books. And uh, uh, let's say these books are having uh, prices in uh, Kenya shillings. They are having prices in Kenya shillings. That is a certain type of book uh, costs a certain amount. So we will be using numbers to denote uh, various types of books. Suppose I have book type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5. It's not that it is representing the number of books, but it is actually representing a type of a book. So you realize, suppose this first type is, uh, costs six, uh, 60 shillings, the other type costs 150, the other one 210, 300, and maybe 420. The question is, is this table representing a function? Is this uh, table representing fun a function? Is uh, the price a function of books? Is a price a function of type of a book? Of course it is a function. And why is it that we are saying it is a function? Because you realize uh, every uh, type of a book has a specific one price. Like for instance, the book type 1 is having its price as 60, the book type 2 is having its price as 50, and so on. So it is a function because every type of a book has its specific function. We are not having a case whereby the book type 2 costs 150 and it also costs uh, 130 shillings. Suppose we had such a case, then it doesn't qualify to be a function. Why? Because this input here is having two outputs. So it is not a function. But because uh, we are having inputs that are having one and only one output, then it qualifies to be a function. What if now uh, for the book type uh, 5, instead of for, for 20, I'm having 60 shillings as the price. Will it still be a function? You realize the book type 5 has its price as 60 and the book type 1 has the price as 60 also. Is this a function? The answer is yes, it is a function. Why? Because every type of a book, every input is having one and only one uh, a price. One and only one price. That is the price is 60, 150, 210, 360. Despite that they have the same, but they are from different type. So it is still a function. And you realize uh, this can be uh, represented graphically. Like uh, for a, a good example is uh, the quadratic, uh, uh, the quadratic uh, function. The quadratic function. You realize... I, the quadratic function will always uh, uh, be of that form, will always be of that form. And you realize at this point here, I'm having different outputs, uh, different inputs. For instance, let's say this is 2 and this here is negative 2. You realize at 2, I'm having the output as 0 and at negative 2, I'm having the uh, output as also 0. So you realize there are two different points, but they have the same output. So because of that, uh, it doesn't mean it is not a function. Of course, it is a function, despite that they have different uh, inputs having the same output. What is important uh, for it to qualify to be a function is that a function has to have uh, that every input has only one output doesn't mean they should be different but if it does have an output then it must be only one that is uh, for the first case we can have a second example we can have a second example and say and this is the example that we mostly use we represent a a, a, a function uh, in a table form suppose i have a uh, x values and y values say that i have x as 1 uh, x uh, as 0 1 x as 2 uh, 3 4 
uh, like that and realize I'll be having uh, y values, let's say 3, 6, uh, 11, 7, and negative 2. The question is, is this a function? Is this table of values of x and y representing a function? The answer is yes. Of course, it is representing a function. Why? Because every input x is having an output, uh, only one output, actually. It is having only one output. That is, every input of x is having only one output of y. So, suppose I have uh, an, uh, another column here and uh, say, I have another column here and say, I'm having, uh, I'm, now I'm having three here, I'm having three here, and uh, it is actually nine. Will it still be a function? If I add uh, x as three and y as nine, will it still be a function? The answer is not. It's not a function. Why? Because I'm having the same output here, but giving two different uh, I'm having the same inputs here, but uh, it is giving two different output. I'm having the same input, but it is giving two different output. And because of that, it doesn't qualify to be a function. Why? Because if the inputs are repeated with different output, then it doesn't qualify to be a function. It doesn't qualify to be a function. As well, we were saying we can represent uh, functions uh, as formulas. We can represent functions as formulas. So suppose I have area of a circle, like I was saying, is equals to pi r squared. You realize this is a function. Why? Because if you give me a radius r, uh, it will give me only one area. It will give me only one area and that the area depends on radius and every radius have one area. Suppose you give me the radius as five. You give me the radius as five. It won't give me two areas. It will only give me one specific area. So of course, yes, it's a function. And there are many ways of representing a function graphically like uh, we can have a graph uh, uh, like that and uh, Yes, we have a function represented like that. Still, this represents a function. It still represents a function. So maybe we can go ahead and uh, uh, look uh, more about functions. But the key point about a function is that it has to have only one output for each input. A function has to have only one output for each input. Now, uh, you realize in most of the cases, we will be using a uh, y uh, to denote a function. And uh, this y uh, at times can also be represented as f of x. So we'll be having, uh, uh, actually there are many ways to represent uh, a function. But we realize uh, in most of the cases, the f of x uh, mode of representing a function is actually preferably more than a uh, 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 representing a function as y. Despite that y is equals to f of x, we mostly tend to use uh, this notation to represent a function. And why is that? Suppose I have a function y and this function y is equals to 3x squared minus 4x plus 2. And I also have another function uh, and have the same function f of x is equals to 3x squared minus 4x uh, plus 2. You realize these two are actually the same uh, functions, but they are denoted differently. They are represented uh, differently. That is, in the first function, it is represented as y, and in the second function, it is represented as f of x. And now here we are saying that uh, the y type of uh, function uh, is uh, uh, not actually the best way to represent a function. And this is because it is not easy to distinguish uh, uh, functions using this notation. Compared to uh, the f of x uh, type of notation, it is easy to distinguish a uh, uh, function using this uh, uh, equation. And how is that? Suppose I have various function here. Let's say I know this will be amazing. y is equals to 3x uh, squared minus 4x plus 2. I have another function y is equals to 5x plus 4. 
and I have another function y is equals to 2x squared plus 6. And now uh, 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 one asks you uh, like uh, what is the value of y when x is equals to 2? What is the, uh, the value of y when x is equals to 2? What will be the answer? You will uh, actually have to ask him which question, question are you, which function are you talking about? Are you talking about the first function, the second function, or the third function? Because we are not uh, 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 sure of which uh, function to use to substitute the value of x to get the value of y. So you realize uh, because of this, we tend to use uh, the, f, uh, the f of x notation such that uh, these same functions can be, can be represented as f of x is equals to 3x squared minus 4x plus 2. Let's say here I have g of x is equals to uh, 5x plus 4 uh, and uh, h of x is equals to 2x squared plus 6. Such that now in this case, someone will be like, uh, what is the value of g of x when x is 2? And you realize it will be easy to get the value because we actually all know that it is, he is speaking uh, of this function. But for this case, uh, one has to specify. Again, another advantage of using uh, this notation is that uh, uh, we uh, if we plug in a value of x to get the output, it will be uh, it will clearly tell us what value of x was actually plugged in to give the output. Uh, unlike in this case, it won't uh, tell us what value of x was plugged in to give us that output. So, for example, uh, uh, y for the first uh, equation uh, or function y is equals to three x squared minus four x plus two. Suppose we substitute in y, uh, we substitute in the value of x as 0. We set x to be 0. So it will be 3 into 0 squared minus 4 into 0 plus 2. And my y will give me 2. So assuming we, we don't have this part here, we don't have uh, this part here, we only have y is equals to 2. Will we be able to tell what value of x was actually substituted in the original function to give us y is equal to 2? No, we won't be able. But uh, what if we use this notation now, f of x is equal to 3x squared minus 4x plus 2? You realize if uh, I want to find the value of x, uh, the value of f of x when x is 2, which in most of the cases we'll call it f at 0, we will actually substitute in uh, 0 whenever we have x. So this will be f at 0 is equals to 3, 0 squared minus 4 into 0 plus 2, and uh, f at 0 will be 2. So even if we don't have this part, we will be able to tell that actually the value of x that was substituted in the formula was 0 and it was giving us 2. We will be able uh, to tell what value was plugged in uh, to get 2. And actually, we can even go ahead and write this in coordinate form and say uh, it is 0, 2. That is uh, the value of x that was plugged in is 0, it's the input value and uh, we, uh, the output was 2 as the y value. So in most of the cases, we'll be using this notation because uh, we'll be able to distinguish between functions and easily tell what value uh, was, or what value of input was plugged in in a function to give us uh, the output. So the second notation is actually the best. So going back to graphs, uh, like we were saying, we can tell which graph represents a function by just looking at a graph. Uh, this is now uh, uh, amazing uh, and uh, because of that, we need to do this on a new page. Uh, we need to do this on a new page. So the question is, uh, if we have a graph, will we be able to tell that this is a, a, a function, that this particular graph represents a function? Yes, we can do that. And how is that? We can use the vertical line test. We can use the vertical line test uh, to test if a graph 
represent a function or not. And how is that? If that vertical line touches only one spot on the graph, then we will be able to tell uh, that that uh, actual graph represent a function. So let's have a case here and say Roman 1, we are having uh, this particular graph. We are, um, I like my y-axis, it is actually very perfect. Uh, so we are having uh, this particular graph and uh, let's say uh, this is a graph of a straight line and it is cutting the x-axis and y-axis like that. So the question is, is this graph representing a function? And the answer is yes. Why? Because if we do a vertical line test, you realize uh, if I have a vertical lines across uh, this graph like that, there should be vertical lines. That is the vertical uh, line test. You realize every uh, input, every input, that is every x value is giving me exactly one output. Every input is giving me exactly one output like that. So because of that, this shows that it is re actually representing a function. It is actually representing a function. So yes, it is a function. It is a function. It is representing a function. It is representing a function. Why? Because if we uh, actually carry out the vertical line test, you realize the every input gives us exactly one output. So it is a function. Suppose we have another case here. Uh, this is now amazing. Uh, I have uh, another graph here uh, like that. I have another graph like that. And uh, uh, the graph is like uh, this. The graph is like that. The question is, is this a function? Is this graph representing a function? And the answer is yes, it is a function. It is representing a function. It represents, okay, write in a short form, uh, a function. It represents a function. And how is that? Because if I do the vertical line test, if I do the vertical line test like that, if I do the vertical line test, you realize every input has exactly one output. Every input has exactly one output. Every input has exactly one output. Uh, even, uh, even though it is not one-to-one, -one. it is not one-to-one -one meaning that uh, every output doesn't, uh, uh, every input has a unique output. It doesn't have a unique output. Like for this case here, you realize we are having an, uh, an, uh, an input and the same here we are having a different input, but they are giving us the same output. So it doesn't have unique outputs for every input. But it is a function because every input has exactly one output. And that is the most important thing about functions. Every input must give us exactly one output. If we do uh, the horizontal test to see if it's one-to-one -one because we test uh, for uh, one-to-oneness using the horizontal uh, line test and you realize it is not one-to-one, -one. like for this case here and the other case here, if I'm having a horizontal line, you realize uh, there is a point here and a point here with the different outputs having the same with the different inputs having the same output. So it is not one-to-one, uh, -one, but yes, it's a function. We can have another case here, another amazing uh, case here. Uh, I have a graph, have a graph like that. Uh, of course, these are my axes, and I have a graph like, uh, uh, like, uh, like this, uh, like that. Oh. This looks amazing in a way. Yeah, I should, okay, like that. Now, is that representing a function? Automatically, the answer is yes, it is a function. Why? Because if we do uh, the horizontal, uh, the vertical line test, uh, you realize every input has exactly one output. On the x-axis, these are the inputs. On the y-axis, these are the outputs. So every 
input has a corresponding one and only one uh, output so it is a function another absolutely amazing uh, case here uh, I have uh, my axis like that I have my axis like that and uh, I have uh, something like this I have something like that and like that. Now, the question is, this is of course, this is my y axis and this is my x axis. The question is, is this graph representing a function? Is this graph representing a function? The answer is yes, it is a function. Someone is like, but we are having cases where we don't have outputs like for instance uh, when x is zero the, uh, we don't have an output here the graph is not actually cutting the axis and at uh, the same case here we don't have an output here here and there the answer is that if we do a vertical line test you realize that every input has exactly one output every input has exactly one output and that is the most thing a uh, important point about functions the every input must have only one output in order for it to qualify to be a function so what does this mean that we don't have uh, outputs here at some points of input it means that a function doesn't uh, mean it should have uh, uh, output for every input but if it does that output must only be one so we are saying not every input has to have an output but if it does then it has to be only one if it does then it has to be only one let's look at uh, uh, at uh, another last graph here before uh, we look at uh, something else before we discuss another uh, uh, another way of defining graphs and such so suppose i have uh, this graph uh, this is my y axis like that and this is my x axis like that so i have now i have this graph or oh, this uh, this is an amazing case huh? this is an amazing amazing case like that this this uh, has to be like an s like like that so is that graph representing a function the answer is no it is not representing a function why because if i do a horizontal line test you realize there is an input here and this input of x here because that is x and this is my y axis this is my x axis you realize <clears throat> if i'm having an input x here and the output actually is some point here another point here and another point here so every input in this case is not having only one output which is the core a point of a function so we are saying it is not a function because every vertical line does not touch the graph once every vertical line does not touch the graph first so that is how we can tell if a graph represents a function or it doesn't represent a function so let's look at another example here uh, to tell if uh, these uh, represent a function or not uh, x squared plus y squared is equals to 25 x squared plus y squared is equals to 25 uh, when you look at that equation it represents a circle that is the equation of a circle uh, and you realize it is representing a circle with the center origin that is zero zero and radius the square root here which is five so we can say it's a, a circle a center zero zero uh, which is uh, the origin we can also say the origin and radius and radius five and radius five but that is not our interest the interest is is this a function is this a function and automatically the answer is not 
Why? Because it's a circle. So obviously, uh, it will fail to pass the vertical test. This is what I'm saying. Eh? If I represent this uh, circle, if I represent, okay, this uh, should be the axis, the y axis. If I represent uh, this circle, this is my origin. So my x axis should pass. Uh, uh, this is 5 here, this is 5 here, this is 5. Uh, that is not my interest though. So this is the center. If I do a horizontal uh, test, a horizontal line test, you realize there is an input here, there is an input here x, which is having uh, two outputs, which is having two outputs. So every input in this case doesn't have only one output. If I'm having a vertical line test here, an input here having uh, two uh, different outputs. So it is not a function. Why? Because every input does not have exactly one output. That is the vertical uh, uh, line test. However, we can test this by solving the function. We can test this by solving uh, for y in the function and see if it's actually a function. Uh, so x squared plus y squared is equals to 25. This is the equation. If we solve for y, you realize I'll be having y squared is equals to uh, 25 minus x squared. And this is actually giving me y is equals to uh, 25 minus x uh, squared. I need to find the square root of both sides because I find the square root here, the square root there. So y is equals to the root of 25 minus x squared. But we all know that the square root of a number can be positive or negative because actually the square root of 4 is uh, negative 2 or 2. Since when I take negative 2 squared, it is giving me 4. And when I take 2 squared, it is also giving me 4. So the square root of a number can be positive and negative. And it is clear here that the y value actually are uh, the value of y which is the output it can be positive or negative so this means that y has two possible solution so y has two possible solutions and since y has two possible solutions uh, it means that uh, this equation is not a function because we are saying for every input we need to have one output suppose i say I, I plug in x is equals to zero in the function i'll be having my y equals to uh, i substitute here zero i'll be having root 25 for the positive it will be five and i will also be having y is equals to negative five so thus it's not a function not a function it's not a function why because uh, for an input in x doesn't give us one output now however we can look at this uh, equation into two parts and get function from uh, from there so we are saying y is equals to plus or minus the square root of 25 minus x squared we can uh, look at this uh, equation as two different parts, as two functions of x, such that in the first case I say f of x is equals to the positive part, which is 25 minus x squared square root. And I can as well say f of a uh, h of x is representing the negative part, that is the negative of 25 minus x squared. And we realize here I'm having two functions representing the equation y and uh, if i look at this part uh, that is f of x is positive 25 minus x squared it is positive so the output of y here is actually positive this means that this function is representing the upper half of the circle where actually the y-axis is positive where actually the y-axis is positive. So the first function f of x is representing the upper half of the function, uh, the upper half of the circle. This part is representing uh, the top uh, half 
of a circle and when i look at this part uh, you realize the output y is actually negative so it is representing at uh, the bottom or rather the lower half of the circle so this one is uh, the bottom uh, half of a circle so basically we can tell if a given uh, expression or fun uh, or uh, uh, an equation is a function by either doing uh, the horizontal the vertical line test or uh, simplifying the function to see if it's, uh, it is having only one output. And if it does, it qualifies to be a function. If it doesn't, like for our case, it doesn't qualify. And we can go ahead and filter the function to see, uh, the equation to see if we can uh, generate functions from uh, the given equation. So with that, I think we have uh, get a better understanding of uh, functions we have uh, a better understanding of functions what is remaining we are going now to introduce what we call a piecewise function piecewise functions what is a piecewise function so uh, we will be discussing a uh, piece uh, wise functions piecewise functions basically uh, a piecewise function, a piecewise function, uh, is a function that changes depending on the input value. So we can say uh, it is a function that changes. It is a function that changes depending on the input value for instance our input value uh, can be x so it is a function that changes depending on the input value the formula in layman's term the formula depends with the input value of uh, of, of what you're trying to plug in in that particular formula and a good example example of a piecewise function is the absolute value function so a, a good example is the absolute uh, value function this is another good example of a piecewise function and uh, we uh, will be using this function uh, to get a clear understanding of what a piecewise function is we realize that a absolute value function an absolute value function let's say absolute x of course uh, this is how we represent an absolute value with the two bars so absolute x absolute x so this is how we represent a, a absolute value with the two bars like that so you realize an absolute value is actually a, that positive value of a given uh, a number so suppose you realize suppose uh, my x is 2 you realize i'll say uh, absolute x will be equal to this is the same as absolute 2 which is 2 and suppose uh, my x now is negative 12 absolute x will be what is my absolute x you realize my absolute x will be my absolute negative 12 which is 12 now you realize you realize uh you realize that uh, you realize that uh, uh, there is a change in the value. So this was uh, positive, and it was giving us a positive. But this is negative, and it is giving us a, tw a, a, a positive. Even though the function is the same, we are using the absolute function. So this means that this absolute function is actually changing depending with the value of the input like for this case my value was positive uh, it gave me positive it was negative and it gave me positive so it means depending with the, the value of the input uh, the function will change uh, we notice if the number is positive like for this case the absolute value function does not change it it is actually giving us two 
But if the number is negative, like for this case, the absolute function changes it, like as you can see here. So literally, the function does two different things depending with the value of x. It does two different things depending with the value of x. That is why it is referred to as a piecewise function. There's this piece and this piece. And uh, we can find uh, that piece uh, or these pieces uh, by using various ways. So we can find that uh, this is a piecewise function if we say, suppose we say that uh, the absolute function f of x is actually the function uh, is representing the uh, function f of x is representing uh, the absolute function like that. And we realize based on this uh, uh, analysis here, this absolute function is actually having two different parts. The first part is when the value is positive. So we will say if x is greater than or equals to zero, what does this function do? Uh, do it will actually retain the value. It is not changing the value. It is just remaining as x. But what if the value, what if now x is less than zero? What does this function do? You realize it does something. It changes this, this value when it is less than, meaning it's negative. And you realize if we have a negative value, let's say negative 12, to change it to positive, we either divide by a negative, like for this case, divide by negative 1, and we are getting 12, or we multiply by a negative, such that we have negative 12, multiply by negative 1, and we are having 12. Either way, if my x, which is now my x, is now representing negative 12, so I'm taking that x, I'm dividing it with negative 1, and I'm getting x, uh, negative x, sorry, or I'm taking that x, I'm multiplying it with the negative 1, I'm getting negative x. So in either case, if the value is less than uh, 0, we will be having negative x. So you realize this is now a piecewise function. This is the piecewise definition of the absolute function. Why is that? We are having a part here and a piece here. These two pieces make the absolute function. That's the name, piecewise function. We can generate uh, the graph of the piecewise function as well. And how is that? By graphing each piece individually uh, based on the domain, based on the given domain. The domain is where that function uh, is uh, are actually defined. Like for this case, uh, my domain is x greater than or equals to zero. And in this case, my domain is x less than uh, zero. So we can uh, graph this function. And here is the graph. We can graph uh, this function. We can represent this function on a graph. Rather, we can say we can represent this function on a graph like that. This is my x and this is my f of x like that. That is my f of x. Now you realize Now, like we are saying, you realize that uh, uh, we, I'm having two different domains, x greater than 0 and x is less than 0. So for this case, uh, my x here is greater than uh, 0. We are starting with this piece. We have just said that we can graph piecewise function by graphing each piece individually for the given domain, for the given domain. So you realize... Uh, this part is actually x is greater than 0, which is the positive uh, x here. So for this case, uh, f of x, it is as if I'm saying for the first case, for the first piece here, it is like f of x is equals to x. Not like, but it is actually is. f of x is equals to x. So for every x value, uh, if x is 1, then my f of x will be 1 x is 2, my f of x is 2, like that. And we realize it is a straight line to rule the origin. It is a straight line to rule the origin. It is not straight, my line, of course, but that is what it is. Uh, it should be. So this is my f of x is equals to x. Now, for the other piece, you realize that uh, 
this is f of x is equals to negative x and uh, the domain is x is less than so actually it is this uh, negative part of x here and uh, for every negative x i'm having a positive x based on the definition we are changing the negative to positive so i'm having a positive uh, a positive value of f of x such that now uh, i'll be having another straight line passing through the origin like that and this will represent my f of x is equals to negative x and with that i'm having my v shaped uh, piecewise uh, graph uh, so basically to uh, to represent a piecewise function on a graph we uh, actually uh, uh, plot each piece based on the uh, domain given so we are plotting uh, each piece individually uh, for the given domain for the given domain maybe we can have another example here that uh, we, we will be actually uh, amazing and advanced on how we can sketch a piecewise uh, function on how we can sketch a piecewise function so suppose i have the function uh, say g of x g of x and uh, the function g of x is actually defined by zero such that x is less than or equals to negative one and uh, it is also defined by the function one minus x squared square root such that uh, negative one is less than x less than one and finally i'm having x such that x is greater than or equals to one i'm having this kind of a function a piecewise function a function that is actually having three different pieces it is a function having three different pieces so i need to plot that on a graph now you realize in order to do this we are going to graph this function piece by piece piece by piece by breaking up the domain first so by breaking up the domain first and when i say the domain is actually the input value which are actually the x value so if i draw my uh, plane like that my 2d plane like that if i draw my two plane like that you realize uh when i check at the domain when i check at the domain uh, the first is at negative one so i will be having negative one somewhere here uh, we are actually uh first uh, breaking the domain uh in the given ranges of the pieces so i'm having negative one another piece is at one another piece is at one here so you realize i'm ending up with three pieces that is i'm having the piece below a negative one that is less than negative one i'm having the piece in between negative one and one this is the second piece and the third piece is actually greater than one the question is how do i sketch that very simple so for the first case at negative one x is less than negative one we are saying g of x is zero so this is my x and this is my g of x so my g of x here is actually zero so you realize uh, this is where my g of x is zero so this is the graph uh, from uh, uh, wherever it will start to negative one and you realize at negative one we are saying x is less than or equals to negative one meaning that negative one is included so because of that i'll be having a closed loop here i'll be having a closed loop there now for the second bit for the second bit from negative one to one i'm having the function like that actually if this is hard for you to do you can simplify say we know g of x is representing y so we can simply say the first piece is y is equals to zero such that x is less than or equals to one the other piece is y is equals to uh, one minus x squared square root like that such that a negative one is less than x less than one the other piece is y is equals to x such that x is greater than or equals to one 
Now you realize that is why actually we were saying uh, here that uh, this function y value is zero here. Now you realize when you look at the second interval that is from negative one to one here on this function, this function actually represent uh, the equation of a circle. Actually, not equation of a circle, but the top half of an equation of a circle. And how is that? Because here it is assuming a positive. And we can even extract this part and see if it is actually representing a circle. You realize we are saying y is equals to 1 minus x squared square root. If we square both sides, we will be having y squared is equals to 1 minus x squared. Taking x to the other side, I'll be having y squared plus x squared is equals to 1. And this is actually a circle and its center, its center is the origin 0, 0 and radius is equals to 1 because it is the square root of 1 which is 1. But we are saying this circle, actually it is not an equation of a circle, but rather uh, the top half of a circle because of it assume a positive here. So it means it is the top half and this half is ranging from negative 1 to 1. So I'll come here on the graph and say uh, this top half is moving from negative 1 to 1 and the radius is 1. The center is the origin 0, 0. So at the center here, radius is 1, meaning it is this part, this part, and some point here where y is 1. So my upper half of the circle will be moving uh, like that. It will be moving like that. Now, what happens at 1? It is less than, based on the function, it is less than 1. Meaning here, I'll be having an open loop at 1. I don't have a closed loop. It is an open loop. Let's go to the last part. I told you, this is amazing. The last part is y is equals to x, such that x is greater than or equals to 1. Such that x is greater than or equals to 1. Now, when you look at this function y is equals to x, is actually a function that passes through the origin. That is, when x is 0, y is 0. When x is 1, my y, which is g of x, is 1. When x is 2, my g of x is 2. And it is passing through the center. But we are saying the limit is at x is greater than or equals to 1. x is greater than or equals to 1. Meaning, this function is not starting at zero but it is actually starting at where x is equals to one so where x is equals to one my g of x is one where x is equals to two all the way so actually this is a straight line starting at x is equals to one and you realize at x is equals to one it is included such that x is greater than or equals to one so it is included that is why i'm having a closed loop here and it is moving all the way like that. So this is how we can sketch a piecewise function. We sketch a piecewise function by uh, breaking up the domain first. We break up the domain first uh, in appropriate ranges and uh, graph the pieces. So we break down uh, the, 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 the domain of the pieces, then we, we, we plot the pieces. That is how uh, we represent piecewise function on a graph. So uh, with that, I hope now we have get a clear understanding of functions. And because of that, we will come to end of this tutorial. Let's meet in the next tutorial when we'll be discussing uh, the domain and range of functions the domain and range of functions all you need to do is to subscribe click the notification button and wait for the best tutorial thank you